Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to FOP lung health. So my name is Hope Newport. I'm the Family Services Manager at the International FOP Association. And for those who are joining us who need translation support, um, I just put a link in the chat. You can go ahead and click that link to access AI translation. Um, and I know we have a lot of new friends who've registered to join us today. So I wanna start by just pointing out a few ways for you to engage as attendees. In the bottom of your screen, you should see a black toolbar. Um, that toolbar has a chat button. So you can say, hello, introduce yourself, tell us where you're from there if you'd like. And there is also a Q&A button. So if you have questions for Dr. Chung, um, please put those in the Q&A to make sure that we can see them. And if you, um, it's easier for you to uh, click the raise hand button on that bottom toolbar, um, we can unmute you so you're able to ask your question verbally if it's um, easier to do that. And um, that should be it. So I wanted to, um, if you can uh, go on to the next slide, Dr. Chung, to start by um, expressing my gratitude to um, several different aspects or parts of our community who made today's webinar possible. So um, I'd like to start by thanking the um, FOP members who are joining us here today. So all of you who are attendees who have shared your knowledge of your journey with FOP, um, I'm excited that we'll be featuring a family member from the community later, later in our presentation today. Um, and she's just a really great example of sort of the team approach that you all take to sharing helpful tips and navigating life with FOP. So thank you for being a part of today's webinar. Um, I'd like to thank, secondly, our team of FOP medical experts who help to advise families on the safest and most effective ways to apply the ideas that you all bring to the table. So the International Clinical Council on FOP is a um, group that you all may be familiar with. They write the FOP treatment guidelines, which really served as sort of the, um, the jumping off place, the starting point for our presentation today. And um, you know, especially Dr. Ed Shao, he is a doctor at UCSF who has brought this topic of FOP respiratory and lung care to the main stage as a top priority for our community. He's done um, presentations on this topic at I think the last five FOP family gatherings. So he's a great resource and we appreciate the time he's spent. Um, and before I move on to thanking today's presenter, I want to acknowledge BioCris Pharmaceuticals, who gifted the IFOPA their support of our 2023 Family Services Programming shortly after leaving the FOP clinical trial space. Um, but I'm thrilled, um, Dr. Chung, if you want to move to the next slide, to have Dr. Angela Chung joining us here today. So Dr. Chung, as you can see, is the director for the Center of Excellence in Skeletal Health Assessment. She's a Canada Research Chair Tier 1. Um, musculoskeletal and menopausal health and professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. And she is one of the FOP experts serving families in Canada. So um, Dr. Chung and I actually met at the 2022 Drug Development Forum in Dallas, um, a conference that she traveled to just to stay up to date on the latest research um, about FOP. And I think that speaks volumes to how dedicated and committed she is to our community. And she's an incredibly busy lady. She is working in a lot of different things right now, but we're so grateful that Dr. Chung, that you took the time to um, work with me and to join us here today to share your expertise with our community. So with that, I will hand it over to you. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Hope, for uh, inviting me uh, to um, discuss this topic. Um, it's also uh, very um, dear to my heart in terms of looking at uh, really beyond sort of bone health, uh, because um, that's really what affects um, both quality of life and also um, uh, probably duration as well. Um, so thank you and thank you for working on this. Um, so Hope um, uh, has been working on this presentation uh, with me for a while and uh, she's uh, very talented in uh, putting these things together. Um, so what I would like to do um, is um, to really go over uh, respiratory health and FOP and how we can assess uh, lung health, um, how to use the spirometer, how we can uh, maintain uh, lung health um, uh, as a sort of FOP may be progressing, 
And also, um, how can we manage sort of decreased lung function? Um, and also, how do we sort of, when do we need to consult a specialist? Um, so um, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm a general internist. Um, so um, I am in endocrinology, um, but uh, it's really because of my interest in bone that I get into endocrinology. But it's mainly I look after sort of uh, general internal medicine. And so I see patients um, both as outpatient as well as uh, inpatient. And over the years, I've always had an interest in bone health. And so that's how I got into FOP. And I've been looking after FOP patients um, for the last eight years. Um, so why is it important? Um, so it, it's because with FOP, as you all know, that there is extra bone growth. And the extra bone growth, especially around the chest, uh, can limit um, the expansion of the chest. And so um, usually uh, the way that our lungs are working is really, it's a passive thing. Think of it as um, something that's inside the chest and it's because of the muscles um, that move the lungs. So for example, uh, in a normal person, um, the way that we take a deep breath in is by contracting various muscles. So there's the intercostal muscles between the ribs and when they contract, um, uh, I don't know if you can see me, but if, when they contract, um, uh, what happened is that um, they lift the, the rib cage up. And then there are two pieces of muscle um, that is at the bottom of the lungs called the diaphragm. And when they contract, they're kind of like dome-shaped muscles. When they contract, they will flatten and lower the lungs. And so it's through this lifting of the rib cage and contraction of the diaphragms that sort of expand the lungs. Um, so when we actually have um, a inability to uh, lift the rib cage, we're really relying on um, the diaphragms to work. And um, so far, we have not seen any calcification um, or bone formation in the diaphragms, whereas we actually see bone formation in the rib cage. Um, and um, uh, so often the diaphragm and um, uh, is really important to train uh, to be strong. And so the, the whole thing with this is that we have to be proactive about this and that we should start working on building um, sort of the, the, the strength of the lungs um, to uh, take an air. So um, this is sort of a picture of what I was just talking about. Uh, the diaphragm is what's in, um, uh, I guess it's what's in um, sort of right, right in between the, the lungs um, in blue and sort of the um, internal organs. I don't know if that actually the, the red is supposed to be the diaphragm, um, but um, you can understand that uh, for a healthy lung, it has to be, we have to move secretions uh, easily. So meaning, um, you know, uh, if you have a cough, I mean, this is usually what happens is when we have uh, secretions, we cough it out. Um, so when someone has an infection, they have a cough. Um, the reason there's a cough is that you try to get the gunk out. Um, so, um, and the ability to deep, sort of inhale deeply um, and have a strong cough, that's sort of a healthy kind of lung. So um, it's good to have a baseline. Um, you know, wherever you're starting from, it's good to uh, record. Um, so what you can do. And so what we're suggesting is starting at age four, um, it may be important to um, get some baseline testing, whether it's pulmonary function tests um, and, um, uh, and uh, get a sense of sort of how your lungs are. When your lungs are affected, it will also affect your heart. And so that's why um, you know, we sometimes in uh, more advanced cases will think about doing echocardiograms. And another one that is important is called pulse oximetry, where it's a little thing that goes on your finger and 
uh, it costs like, I don't know, um, $30 um, on Amazon um, that you can keep at home to measure the oxygen saturation in your blood as well. And usually um, anything above 92, uh, 91, we're okay with, um, but anything lower than that, we are concerned about. And so um, having something like that at home may also help you as well. Um, if it's a younger patient, um, you know, obviously it's hard to do certain tests. Um, and so usually um, what we are recommending for maintaining lung health is really um, certain activities. Um, so for example, in the younger uh, patient, like doing blowing bubbles um, <clears throat> would be uh, a good way to sort of expand your lungs or bubble painting, um, like the picture on the, um, on the left lower corner. Um, for um, older patients, singing, uh, doing deep breathing exercises, playing woodwind instruments or recorder, um, and walking also will help um, expand your lung function as well. Um, and what happens is when your lungs, so when your lungs are not fully expanded, there are parts of the lung that the medical term is called atelectasis, but what it really means is, th is that it's not expanded fully and that it's just sort of a bit collapsed. And usually that can happen at the bottom of the lungs. And so by taking a deep breath, you expand every part of the lung. The lung is kind of like, think of it as like a spongy kind of structure. Um, so it can be squished and it can expand. And so the recommendation uh, from most physicians who are looking after FOP patients is to uh, do at least 15 or 30 minutes, 30, 15 to 30 minutes of deep breathing kind of exercises. And here uh, is um, a community member who um, uh, uh, has uh, uh, have a YouTube video, and I think uh, Hope, um, uh, do you want to put uh, the link? Um, oh, you did. Okay, so I'm gonna just gonna click on it and show you, um, so so that you get a sense. Okay, I'm going to show you three exercises that you can do to improve your lung health. The first one I call five five five. You Inhale, fill your lungs, hold the breath, and the blisters in the bottom of the lungs fills. They kind of clean the lungs. And then you're going to exhale. The second one, we're going to use a straw. I know many of you have it. Going to just slowly inhale and exhale through the straw. And the third one is also using a straw, just going to exhale through the straw and the inhale comes out of the nose. But we start with five, five, five. So, sit. So I'm just um, showing you this um, so that you can get a sense. Uh, you can sort of use this uh, link um, in the video. Um, so that um, you can uh, uh, practice uh, with some of these exercises as well. Um, for my patients, I just teach deep breathing um, and there are many different ones, right? There's the box breathing. Um, there is the pranayama and yoga. Um, there's also something called qigong um, in the Asian art of uh, breathing exercises. But usually what I tell my patients is to take a deep breath in and try to expand your lungs slowly. Um, and, um, uh, and over a uh, sort of, uh, a, you know, inhale as, as best as you can, and then exhale slowly as well. And the whole cycle is about six to 10 seconds. And, and if you can do that, like five in the morning, five at night, then you can actually increase it to 10 in the morning and 10 at night. And I also teach patients to, when they inhale um, uh, fully, to take a little bit more um, at the top 
right? So you think you can't take a little bit more, you try to take a little bit more. And again, when you breathe out all the way um, at the end, if you can, uh, you think, okay, I'm done, like try to squeeze the last piece of air out. Um, so that's what uh, I've been teaching um, some of my patients. Um, and But you can use many different uh, techniques in terms of uh, breathing exercises uh, for the lungs. And so um, one of the uh, one of the things I also um, introduce to my patients is actually an incentive spirometer. And there are many different types. Um, so this is just one of them, but most of them will have a tube and have a mouthpiece like this one, and also have a ball um, that you're supposed to keep at a certain level. And so <clears throat> this is actually a very good um, tool. Um, and we use it in the hospital all the time um, when people are you know, sick and not well, and we need them to um, really expand their lungs. Uh, we use this tool um, a lot. And so you can work with your primary care provider um, to um, see, sort of set a goal. And I can also share with you that <clears throat> some of my patients have come back to me and say, um, I started here, but actually <clears throat> now I can do better. Um, and I can, I, I, I see my level improve over time. And so um, let me just show you um, this. Um, so it's a video um, and using this kind of incentive spirometry, uh, <clears throat> you will see uh, that, oops, you, you, you will see um, that, <clears throat> um, See the ball on the right? You wanna keep it up as much as you can. Um, and, um, and on the left, you can actually get a sense of the volume. So this is the indicator. You want to keep the ball in that range um, uh, up as much as you can. And on the left, it really shows you how high uh, you can get. And so one of my patients told me they started sort of, you know, between 500 and 1,000, but now that they have worked on it over time and keeping the ball to the right, they now can do like 1,500, 2,000. So um, this is something that is um, a good um, uh, technique um, to try to improve your lung function. And I would say that you can keep a journal as well, noting down what you can do, um, like um, in terms of um, the volume part and keeping track of that as well. Um, in the smaller um, uh, kids and children, uh, that may be kind of boring um, for them to do. Um, so, uh, you know, we need to find options that are uh, appropriate for the younger uh, kids. And so um, this whistle, it's called the peak blow whistle. Um, it can, it makes a sound uh, when the air is exhaled quickly through the uh, whistle. And so, um, but uh, in terms of how, um, you know, you need to take a deep, deep breath before you can really make this whistle go very loud. Um, and so it's really the slowly inhaling as much as you can and um, hold it for 10 seconds and then exhale as quickly as you can through the whistle to generate the sound. And that um, can be more um, uh, easier for children to do rather than staring at this bubble. Um, and uh, you can consider using this peak flow uh, whistle. Um, so one thing about um, in, improving sort of lung health is being proactive. And uh, to be proactive, obviously, we try to prevent infections. And um, one of the uh, uh, usual prevention is vaccination. Uh, now, um, uh, before talking about vaccination, I would say that there are many other things that we can uh, improve on infections as well. Obviously, trying not to get infections is an important thing. So masking, hand washing, avoiding high risk environments, uh, social distancing, making sure that um, 
Uh, ventilation is good in areas that you're gathering um, and making sure that close family members are vaccinated as well um, will decrease uh, your risk of infection. And we're not just talking about COVID or flu, but there are so many viruses out there um, and, uh, you know, that can cause pneumonia. And so, <clears throat> and, and so uh, in terms of vaccinations, um, uh, Ed uh, Xiao actually um, um, actually sort of uh, presented data uh, on vaccination um, in uh, COVID vaccination in FOP patients. And uh, there's always a risk when you do uh, intramuscular uh, injections. Um, but out of the folks who actually did it, um, uh, really only one uh, plus or minus another person who had a uh, you know, FOP flare. Um, and so um, it's uh, good to remember that. And usually um, I also recommend that if people are thinking about injections to make sure that it goes in an area that is already ankylosed um, so that you can't really do further damage to it um, in terms of uh, decreasing range of motion. Um, so uh, I would suggest that if you're thinking about vaccination, discuss this with your physician and see if it's appropriate um, and the pros and cons of those things as well. Um, so um, there are other things. Um, so when you actually have very decreased lung capacity, uh, there are medications that can thin the mucus um, and um, there are saline nebulizers. Uh, there are inhaled medications that the physician can give, give you. And more importantly, I think, um, you know, swallowing is an important piece as well. So uh, we have a speech language pathologist who actually work with some of our patients to uh, teach swallowing techniques so that they don't aspirate. Um, so as things get worse with FOPs, it comes to a point where you may need to um, not be drinking uh, thin fluids and we need to thicken the fluids uh, so that you don't aspirate. Um, and also um, so for some patients, um, uh, you know, they choke when it's a big piece of meat or something. And so you have to adjust to make sure that you it's things are minced um, and easier to swallow. Um, so you can certainly, there are, there are um, healthcare professionals like a SLP or speech language pathologist or a respiratory therapist and RT um, uh, about, uh, and discuss about these things. Um, there's also chest physio that may be helpful um, to you as well um, if you are choking all the time and um, aspirating all the time. Um, and so uh, for patients in this category, I would say that uh, consulting a respirologist or pulmonologist uh, would be important. And sometimes sleep studies uh, to, to see if someone actually has sleep apnea um, and um, other issues um, to see if they have decreased oxygenation when they're asleep. Um, because there are uh, things that we can do proactively um, so that um, people don't get into uh, trouble. Um, the other the other parts about sort of being proactive is uh, other than food is medications. And so, um, you know, there are pill cutters, there are crushers, not all pills can be cut or crushed, um, but there are um, sometimes dissolvable sort of versions, even in supplements, right? Um, and um, uh, and for some patients, if they are having these issues, uh, suction device or something called the positive expiratory pressure device are good to uh, keep at home to uh, improve airway clearance and also remove and loosen mucus that are stuck. Um, and so uh, these are some of the things that you can consider. Um, and, you know, talk to your respirologist um, in terms of what is more helpful in your situation. And um, the IFOPA is hoping to actually have a ability toolbox guidebook 
um, under preventive, preventative health, pulmonary um, uh, health, uh, that it uh, would be available. And uh, I can ask, uh, hope to sort of discuss that a little bit more. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the end of our presentation. Yeah, so I'll just piggyback off of what Dr. Chung touch, touched on. Um, if you want to go back one slide, Dr. Chung, I will mention that this um, section unit that you see pictured is already in the Ability Toolbox Guidebook. And what we're working on is getting more tools. Um, I believe we um, might have a pill cutter in there, but adding the positive expiratory pressure device. Um, and you know, if there are other tools that you all use, the guidebook is a resource that um, Karen Kirkhoff, our family services coordinator, heads, and she really wants it to be a tool for the community, sort of by the community. So if there are things that um, have been effective for you or different sort of hacks, adaptions you've used, please send them to her. Um, and we want to build this section right now. I think our pulmonary health section just has a few things in it, but we want it to be um, a really uh, in-depth tool for all of you. So um, Dr. Chung, if you want to, sorry, now go forward to the next slide. I just wanted to mention that um, we are working on an introduction to FOP lung health handout that will be sort of a compressed front and back version of the presentation that Dr. Chung has done today. And this is a resource that I think is really valuable for a lot of our families watching a full webinar that's half an hour long, you know, is kind of a big ask. So this resource would be something that you could keep at home, you could bring to your primary care provider to show them information. And we do have a version, an introduction to FOP oral health um, that we created several years ago. And so we're hoping to kind of broaden that library of resources for all of you. Um, so I think now we're ready to move into the Q&A. And um, before we jump into that, I just wanted to say that a lot of what um, we've shared today are, you know, tools or information for you to bring to the conversation with your primary care provider or your medical support team, but that um, advocacy is a big part of that. So if advocating in the medical setting is something that you feel like you could use a little extra support with, um, the IFOPA is here as a resource to you and that as well. We have some um, a webinar, a podcast, a community panel that we've done to highlight how different members of the community have had those discussions. Um, and I know it's something that can be challenging for people, but um, that there is support there as well. So let's see, Dr. Chung, one uh, question that's come in, what can I do? Um, <laughs> I think if someone is experiencing issues with snoring, um, do you have any suggestions related to that? Or is there an issue if someone is snoring? Would that be a concern? Anything that you would flag as something that needs to be followed up on? Um, that's a great question. So, um, uh, you know, um, uh, we do sort of pay attention when someone is snoring, especially snoring loudly and um, and also sort of uh, have a period where they may not be breathing. Um, so um, uh, that I think it's good to um, make sure that uh, you don't have something called sleep apnea. Um, and um, most patients with sleep apnea um, feel not refreshed after they've had, um, after they slept. Uh, because um, what happened is that they'll breathe and then they'll stop breathing, then they'll you know, breathe again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, snoring can be because of many different reasons. It can be a narrowing of the nasal passages. It can be, it can be a number of reasons. And um, you know, it should be sort of looked into. Um, and uh, there are sleep studies that people can do. Um, uh, so usually you go to a sleep lab and sleep uh, for the night. Um, and uh, they put, um, you know, different monitors on you uh, while you're sleeping. Um, and then they can get a sense of how many times you are really waking, even though you don't really know that you're waking up. Um, and uh, what some of these issues are as well. And so um, rather than, you know, just, uh, you know, are there ways to stop the snoring? I think you should look into this a little bit more. A few other questions. Um, someone was asking about how often one should be using their spirometer. That's a daily 
activity. That could be an example of one of the 15 to 30 minutes of daily activity. Um, the, a follow-up question to that was how often should one have a PFT done? And there were um, a couple other questions people were wanting to know how often they should check in with their specialists for lung tests. So I know Dr. Chen, we've discussed that. Do you mind sharing sort of your perspective on how often the testing or um, seeing a specialist should be done for patients? Yeah, so um, uh, I would say that it really depends on your situation. Um, so if you are someone who actually doesn't have a lot of flare-ups and uh, your uh, the, the FOP that's affecting you are mostly peripheral and not central, uh, then you don't have to do these things that often um, in terms of like consulting a respirologist or, or pulmonologist or uh, pulmonary function tests. Um, but if it's something, you know, you have um, uh, more central, like it's in your back, it's in your, in, um, on your chest, uh, then I would say um, at least once a year um, in terms of pulmonary function tests. Um, but it really depends on sort of where things are at. And you should have a discussion with your uh, provider as well. Um, and uh, I do suggest people, uh, once they have had sort of back and um, uh, anterior chest um, kind of uh, heterotopic ossification uh, to do uh, pulmonary function tests at least once a year. Um, and uh, we're trying to get that done. Um, it's not sometimes not that easy for the full set of pulmonary function tests um, because um, you know some of our patients live very remotely. Um, whereas um, it's easier to do spirometry. Um, and uh, so that's measurement of FEV, um, force expiratory volume in one second, FEV1, and also force vital capacity, FVC. And so, so the spirometry part is easier to do um, rather than a full set of pulmonary function. So depending on where you are and what you have access to, um, those are some of the things that I would suggest. Okay. And one other question that was submitted ahead of time, um, the oscillating positive expiratory pressure device. So um, we talked on the PEP, we mentioned the PEP device and the OPEP is sort of a variation of that. And so um, I think our recommendation, Dr. Chung, you can confirm this, was that, you know, for all the different devices that are out there that may be marketed to families um, for lung health, that it's really important to discuss those with your respiratory health team or your primary care provider. Yeah, for sure. So um, that's what I would suggest is that uh, because there's so many devices out there. I mean, I we show you here some of the common ones, um, but there's so many devices and some actually um, you know, your clinician would have experience with working with it and um, some are better than others, uh, right? And so like we showed the incentive spirometry, um, that's a fairly standard thing that we have been using for many, many years. Um, and so uh, not just in FOP population, but in other populations as well. And we know it helps. And so we want to recommend things that actually um, people have had some experience with that actually work. Um, because there's so many things that are being sold um, on in the marketplace. And so we want to hear from you too. We learn from you in terms of if you try something and you think it's helpful, uh, please share with us. So a few more questions have come into the, the Q&A. One is about a, um, a runny nose symptom. And is there a possibility that that could be related to lung health? Um, if you've been having that for an extended period of time, so for years, you've had this runny nose. Um, so um, people uh, that have a runny nose, um, there are various reasons. Um, sometimes there's an allergy type situation. Um, so ster nasal steroids, um, so it's a spray that you sort of shake and it's a medicated uh, spray um, and you have to tilt your head this way um, uh, forward um, and down a little bit and you aim for like one o'clock and 11 o'clock. Um, those kinds of steroid spray will help um, in terms of stopping the runny nose. The issue with a runny nose, uh, it's fine if it's running down this way, meaning out, 
It's another issue when it becomes a post-nasal drip, meaning the fluid is not running down this way, but it's actually going to the back of your throat and going down that way because that will collect in the lungs. Um, and so um, we, so that's why we usually would treat that. The other thing that we would treat, if especially if it's an allergy, um, we would use an antihistamine. Um, and I try to use antihistamine in... Um, in uh, some of our uh, FOP patients who have a lot of um, flare-ups because sometimes the first reaction is a histamine reaction. And so it may play a role not only for, um, you know, decreasing the histamine reaction when people have a flare-up, but if you have a nasal drip or something, you may want to consider uh, using that. So discuss it with your um, physician. Um, one more question that I wanted to ask, um, there was a father of a two-year-old daughter and they were just wondering, I know we've touched on, you know, the, um, recorders and the blowing bubbles. Is there anything else you would say to parents of young children, not just about exercises to promote lung health, but things to be aware of or, um, guidance, I guess, for that age group? Um, uh, I think um, being able to um, be uh, as active as possible will also improve lung health. Um, uh, and um, uh, like singing um, in young kids as well, it's a good way to expand the lungs. Um, if your kid is like constantly, you know, choking and coughing, uh, then we need to look into, uh, you know, the swallowing issues um, and try to change the consistency of the diet um, uh, food um, and, and change maybe pills and stuff. Um, is there anything else that I can think of? So I'm, I'm actually not a pediatrician. <laughs> so um, I don't know if anyone else in the audience who actually uh, are uh, on the pediatric side um, I do see some young patients, but they are all in their teens. Um, so, uh, but so I don't actually look after very young patients. It's something we can certainly follow up on as well. But there yeah. is just one more question, I think, in the Q and A um, before we wrap up today. So this is about long COVID. I don't know, Dr. Chung, if you can see that, if you'd like to answer that, or if you'd like to follow up individually. Um, and I see something else as well. So um, uh, someone actually put, um, you know, what about microphones? <laughs> um, uh, yes, kids love to sing into these, like, um, you know, uh, sort of the, the kid version of karaoke, um, where there's a microphone and they can sing along. I think that is also a great suggestion. Um, and um, uh, and so there is a question about um, if someone is uh, having sort of uh, long COVID shortness of breath, um, so um, uh, and feel sort of short of breath within enclosed spaces. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, you need to work with someone um, uh, with regard to that piece. Um, you have to understand how much of that is um, uh, anxiety um, and how much of that is, um, you know, uh, actually having trouble uh, with breathing. And so sometimes I do tell people, you know what, like you can bring your oximeter. And yes, the oximeter sometimes don't work, but it is also a reassurance to you that you are, uh, your oxygen levels are okay. And so just, um, you know, um, just try to take slow, deep breaths. Um, but when, um, when it's an anxiety issue that prevents someone uh, from, uh, so from feeling sort of short of breath, um, uh, then uh, we need to work on that side as well. And um, a, a, a psychology counselor or, you know, uh, someone can help. Um, and usually what we do is um, sort of gr graduate, uh, sort of like a gradated kind of exposure. So don't spend an hour, <laughs> you know, like spend five minutes um, as a first thing, and then you improve it to 10 minutes and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, you can certainly reach out to um, someone like that. 
And what is an ideal oxygen level for people to have if they're going into the hospital or if they have a device at home that they can measure oxygen in their blood? What is the ideal range that you that they should be looking for? Everyone is a little bit different. Um, and, um, you know, obviously everything affects it. Like if you smoke and I don't think really this population, is, that's the, an issue per se. Um, but um, uh, and age affects it as well. And so I would say anything um, sort of really uh, mm, higher than 91% um, is good. 91 or higher percent is good. Um, I see it's not it's not that easy to find a hundred percent. So like don't aim for a hundred. But I think what's more important is to know um, uh, what your oxygenation usually is. And if there's a change, so say for example, someone is always um, having oxygen saturation around 97, let's just say, but then consistently, more recently, they're setting around you know 91 percent. Now that's a change. And that change needs to be reported. So even though it's within, quote unquote, the normal range, um, that change needs to be reported, um, you know, to your physician. Now, I do, it's kind of like blood pressure. It does fluctuate a bit. So, you know, don't panic if uh, usually you saturate at 97%, but now it's 91%. And uh, what I would suggest doing is take a deep, few deep breaths and try to cough and expand your lungs and test it again. And sometimes, you know, these oximeters as well, like if you don't put it in quite right in terms of the finger, um, and, or if you have um, nail polish, it mm -hmm. does affect it. So like, don't like, you know, scare yourself. Um, <laughs> it may be one time you have no nail polish and another time you have, you know, um, a, a certain color, you know, lacquered kind of nail polish, right? So um, that's what I would suggest. And I have patients who chronically saturate at around 89 to 91. Um, and, um, but like lower than that, then we need to think about, you know, we can use supplemental oxygen. There are other things that we can do. So please talk to your physician about that. Yeah, but that's a good point. And I know someone asked about the handout, the um, resource handout that I showed. I think one of the reasons I wanted to wait until today's webinar was in case anything else came up that we needed to add to it. And so your point about you know, for it sounds like for um, individuals with FOP, at least individuals who have maybe decreased lung capacity, having a pulse oximeter at home is not a bad idea just for them to make it a part of their daily routine to check that or to be knowledgeable so that um, they're aware. And I see that um, you're trying to give away pulse oximeters at the next family gathering. So that's a great thing as well. Um, one more question about um, if someone is in the middle of the night feeling sort of like a an attack that is maybe a burning or it's difficult for them um, to get a breath, is that something that you would recommend they follow up with a medical provider about? Yeah, so I uh, in the acute setting, when you have something like that, um, try to cough. Um, do as best as you can to cough out, um, you know, usually it's phlegm, okay? And try to take a deep, deep breath and try to clear it. Um, and, but if you have had that experience and you are having these experiences, then you really should talk to your healthcare provider um, because they, I think these are sort of um, sometimes um, uh, signs that, uh, the prov that your healthcare provider has to pay attention to, uh, to prevent sort of, a, you know, um, uh, you having to go to the hospital in an emergency type situation. Great. All right. Well, um, I think we've caught all the questions in the Q&A and the chat. Um, so if anyone else has one, we'll give you just one final minute to drop them in there. But I wanted to um, extend again my gratitude to Dr. Chung for joining us today and spending time answering all of our questions. And thank you to all of you for joining and posing those questions because um, 
like we've both said throughout today's discussion, um, it's in really in collaboration with the community that we're able to learn more about managing the symptoms of FOP and how they impact lung health. So thank you for joining everyone. And I wanted to make sure you all knew that um, the webinar was recorded. So we will have a um, access to that recording on YouTube and we will be posting the resource handout um, in the coming weeks so that you all can access that as well. So thank you, Dr. Chung, and thank you everyone for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.